The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by FreshBooks. Discover a super intuitive way to make creating and sending invoices for your business efficient and simple. Try it out for free for an entire month. Visit freshbooks.com slash candid and enter the candid frame in the how did you hear about section. FreshBooks, it's small business accounting software made just for you. This is Ibody NX and this is the candid frame. Keith Dannemiller is an American-born photojournalist and documentary photographer who has worked and lived in Mexico for most of his professional career. It's provided him a perspective and an opportunity to document life south of the American border. Though much of the news that we get here in the States about Mexico and Central America is often relegated to concerns about drug cartels and immigration, Dana Miller's camera focuses on the rich diversity of life that exists there. Being a photojournalist has always been an interesting and challenging job, and it's no less so when navigating the complex realities of modern Mexico. And Keith Dana Miller succeeds in producing great work, whether he's shooting for a newspaper, a magazine, or for himself. Uh, well, first off, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about your beginnings because you got a degree in organic chemistry. And how does how does someone who's st- studying organic chemistry end up being a photographer, and particularly a photojournalist? Well, there's you know there may not be that big a difference. There may not be that big a di- distance between the two things. I studied at Vanderbilt University in Nashville and got the degree in organic chemistry and did uh, biochemical research for three years, some in Nashville and then in San Francisco, at UC San Francisco, up above Kizar Stadium. I, I think it was the combination of, you know, there was uh, sort of a gap or a hole or something there in 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 my life in terms of what, what the, the science background and the chemistry background uh, was giving me in terms of satisfaction. And so I started to take classes. Long story short, I took classes at San Francisco State with a guy by the name of Neil White in the art department and then a photographer for the Oakland Tribune by the name of Fran Ortiz. And the two of them uh, both sort of encouraged me to try and do some more. And at that point came into a Canon, I think it was a TL model. And it was basically the first camera that I owned, you know, as my own camera. The other ones that I had, you know, were for my dad. I had shot stuff from on cameras that he had. But when I was there, then, 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 you know, it was sort of the the call of the streets in San Francisco, and began to shoot there and set up a dark room and work. And at some point, with the encouragement of both those two sort of mentors, I think it was Neil that said, or no, in that case, I think it was Fran said, you know, if you really want to be a photojournalist and you want to get, you know, some kind of break in with either the Examiner or the Chronicle, it's going to take some time. What you need to do is go out on your own and shoot things and take them to film and see if they're interested. So I, I sort of started that process where I would listen or, you know, to the to the radio or or. TV or read in their newspapers, you know, something was going to happen and and sort of make an intelligent guess that they weren't going to cover it and go out and cover it myself and then take them to film. And it happened, you know, they they bought some of the images that I that I had gone out and shot. And uh, that was sort of like, I don't know if, whether to call it the kiss of death or the kiss of whatever, but it was like, you know, at that point when I learned that, well, you know, I can I can sort of make money and possibly support myself doing this it was like okay uh it was it wasn't overnight obviously but you know that sort of started the process of trying to become you know a photojournalist and and a documentarian i guess and moved from there to austin and began you know working a little bit more seriously with with local and 
uh, national publications, and at that time started to travel to Mexico and, and Central America, and uh, moved to Mexico 30 years ago, 1987, almost 30 years ago, 1987. What was the attraction of moving to Austin rather than remaining on uh, in the San Francisco on one of the coastal cities? I had done a cross-country trip with a friend who was in the Army and got discharged in Oakland and we did a cross country trip and I went all the way up to Maine and came back and went through Austin because my brother was living there. He was studying at UT and uh, met a woman and got involved sort of in the music scene and figured that Austin would be a more there were more possibilities, let's say, in Austin than there actually were in San Francisco for the kind of photography that I wanted to do. So that sort of Austin sort of grabbed me in a bunch of different ways. What were you gravitating to? You just said that uh, the, the kind of photography that you wanted to do. What what kind of photography was that specifically? Well, it was it was it was definitely you know with a photojournalistic slant shall we say, towards photojournalism, but also, you know, just a little bit more uh, documentarian on the street, you know, shooting things that not necessarily had any kind of social import or necessarily were going to be considered photojournalism and go in a, you know, a magazine essay or something like that. Sort of a mix between the two. And I think that sort of characterizes, you know, what I still do to this day. But that was, you know, as, as opposed to, say, you know, in San Francisco, you know, possibly taking a, a commercial route or the whatever, just, you know, not not that that way it was more, you know, I was interested in people. I was interested in the street. I was interested in, you know, yes, photojournalism. Were your first forays in the northern Mexico or the result of editorial work or was it stuff that you had done based on your own personal interest, basically self-assigned? Yeah, the first uh, trips to the north of Mexico from Austin when I was living there were were editorial in nature. I did a story for People magazine on a bullfighter by the name of Jorge de Jesus. His nom de guerre or his fighting name in the ring was El Gleason. He was sort of a iconoclastic kind of bullfighter. He did a lot of stuff that you know people thought was was not in the tradition of you know a good bullfighter. But he was uh, he was very popular, um, did that for People magazine. And at the same time, I got an assignment from Texas Monthly. They were interested in uh, a political story from elections in the state of Nuevo León, uh, focused on the city of Monterey and the candidate who was there. Because uh, the north of Mexico at that time was sort of a hotbed of political activity from the right-wing party, the PAN, and this was a candidate for the PAN who looked like it was possible that he was going to win. And so I did a story on him and, and related things in that political time. And as you started going into Mexico increasingly, what led you to decide to move to Mexico to try and work there as opposed to staying in the, in the States? It was, you know, there were a lot of things. Uh, the, the Austin is a wonderful place to live, and it was a wonderful place to live 30 years ago. But at the same time, once again, sort of the same thing that was, you know, that happened in San Francisco with the uh, with not wanting to continue as a as a as a biochemist. I there was something, you know, living in Austin as nice as it was, as great as it was. It still left some kind of hole. Uh, and, and, and wanting something different. And one of the things that I know, knew that I wanted differently was to live outside the States for a while. So that was number one. Number two was after I had gone to the north of Mexico and then uh, made some trips to Nicaragua and Honduras, uh, I realized, you know, this is sort of the, the direction I want to go, if you want to say that, sort of southward. And at that time, in 1986, almost every newspaper and magazine of any count had their offices in Mexico City. Those newspapers and magazines that wanted to cover Latin America and places, you know, as far south as, as uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, places like that, you know, obviously Central America and all of Mexico. So there was a big expanse of territory and most of those people 
had their offices here in Mexico City. So there was a there was a you know sort of method in my madness of picking up and leaving Austin and coming to Mexico City, and and just like I say to to be outside the United States and experience something else in in terms of culture and society. You know, that's the one thing that has changed dramatically over the last 30 years is is coverage by, you know, uh, U.S.-based press of Central and South America. I, I grew up in that era, and I can remember, you know, the, the, the you know, reporting that was happening in Central America and South America, and it seems like nowadays there's a, there's a dearth of it, and especially since newspapers and magazines, you know, usually do not have reporters or photographers that are that are down there reporting the news. You uh, took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> it's it's the truth. Yes, it's uh, it's changed dramatically, you know, to the point where where now it's uh, most uh, most of those those uh, that media and and those places and those people are now either based out of Miami or New York or or there's or there's just no coverage. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's the case. Well, what was it like when you first went down to Mexico? Because I know uh, from what I was reading, you had a contact there, but by the time you got there, uh, they were no longer there. So how did you sort of find your way into that community of, uh, of photographers and editors? You know, yes, that's the case. When I, I did have a contact and I went to the agency where I had a contact and the guy who, you know, I had met like a year before in Chihuahua uh, shooting there had gone and started his own new agency, new photo agency. But the the place that I arrived to still existed, an agency by the name of Imagen Latina. And the people at the agency, the photographers there, were just, you know, so open and willing to, you know, sort of take under their wing this gringo that spoke sort of comic book Spanish and, but wanted to, you know, wanted to learn something about Mexico. And so they, they ended up showing me the ropes, uh, as far as a lot of that was, uh, photography for, for local publications, national publications in Mexico. But I basically, you know, tailed around with them and shot things, you know, that they needed. And at the same time, I was getting an education about not only about, you know, Mexican, uh, who's who and where's where and all that kind of stuff, but also, you know, being able to, to walk around with them on the streets of the Centro Historico because most of the time the Centro was the place where uh, things happened, where marches ended, where there were meetings, where there were big rallies, where there were speeches. And and so I, I sort of, you know, I guess you could call it a trade-off for, you know, what I did for them as far as, you know, providing them with photos that I shot. And and they, like I say, showing me the city, showing me, you know, the, the ropes of, uh, you know, Mexican politics, Mexican society, Mexican culture. How how did your, your the way that you practice photojournalism sort of change or evolve as a result of moving down to, to Mexico? I I think you know I always my 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 work when I lived in Austin uh, not so much San Francisco but definitely in Austin had a you know uh, somewhat of a social conscious kind of take to it but when I moved to Mexico that changed dramatically society culture politics in Mexico and especially with this agency became, you know, sort of number one priority. And I began to look at things differently, you know, when I uh, photographed with them or when I went out on my own. And I began to look at, you know, the possibility of projects and and photo essays that had much more of a social bent, shall we say, as far as, you know, uh, people who who didn't have a voice, people who didn't have uh, the possibility of participating fully in society those kind of concerns sort of jumped up on my on my scale of 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 importance and and jumped from the back burner onto the front burner and and i started shooting those those kinds of stories those kinds of photo essays you know and 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 i uh, you know fully recognized that 
the reason for that is probably the agency, Magen Latina, a lot of their concerns were those concerns. And so when I hung out with them, when I talked with them, when I photographed with them, that's what, what I, you know, saw and what I ended up doing. What was the community of photographers down there? How did it compare to what you had left behind in the States? Well, for the most part in the States, everybody that I hung out with in Austin, it was sort of like a, it was, it was not, I was not really involved too much in the photojournalistic community in Austin. It was more, you know, photographers, people that were a photographic community. There was, there was a calendar that was, published always in Austin called the Book of Days, and it comprised, you know, 52 or 53 photographs, uh, one for each week and a different photographer for each week. And that group of photographers was sort of my core group in Austin and knew those people and not necessarily the photographers, uh, you know, uh, that were doing photojournalism at the newspapers or, or, you know, working for agencies, UPI, AP those places it was more you know photographers that were doing their own thing that were looking you know for their own projects maybe working for texas monthly maybe working for other magazines but that was and doing commercial work there were a lot of people you know that i were i was friends with that that were commercial photographers in austin when i moved to mexico that that like i say that sort of changed drastically because now my my circle of you know, photographer friends became people that were doing uh, photojournalism in, in for the newspapers, for, you know, the, the both of these agencies, the one that the, the guy that I knew who left and created a new agency, Cuarto Oscuro and, and Imagen Latina were sort of, you know, nascent photo agencies. They were they were like the first photo agencies really uh, that existed in Mexico to provide photos with with somewhat of a you know a political and a social bent to newspapers here in Mexico City to magazines to newspapers you know countrywide um, and and so it was those those were the people that that I you know hung out with and socialized with and photographed with you mentioned uh, Centro uh, earlier, and uh, that has been sort of a focal point, not only for the editorial work that you did, but a lot of your personal work. Let, let's talk about uh, Calligrafia. Uh, Calligrafia. Calligrafia, yeah. And uh-huh. let's let's talk about how that particular part of the city uh, has influenced so much of, uh, of the work that we see in this in this project. It's it's you know. Uh, how to how to describe it? It's sort of like my parallel universe. It's the place that I go where I feel like I can be who I want to be and do what I want to do, and I can operate uh, with a camera. I can be a photographer on the street there, and I don't have the same concerns as a photojournalist or an editorial photographer. It's it may be an escape, it may be a refuge, it may be a sanctuary that that exists that I can. You know, be there and not have to worry about, well, you know, what's the, what's the larger narrative here? What's the larger story that I'm trying to tell? I can look for, you know, moments much more sort of peacefully, much more uh, in tune with those moments and not have to think about, you know, a, a more photojournalistic end to those photographs. And the Centro Historico has always been, you know, a, a focal point for a lot of a lot of foreign photographers, Cartier-Bresson, you know, photographed here. Um, who else comes to mind immediately? Just just a lot of, not necessarily even foreign photographers, but a lot of Mexican photographers too, the, the Centro Historico. The, 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 the constant uh, contrast between buildings that are three or 400 years old and modern, everyday, current activities that go on you know with with all that as a backdrop is is what you know makes me what what draws me to the center and keeps me going there and you know it's uh i've i've walked i've walked the streets down there you know so many times but you know it it never gets old and i'll continue to walk there because you know every time i go down not every time i go down but you know most every time i go down there's there's something there that you know is happening that that attracts me and, and draws me to to photograph. Uh, explain the name of the project. 
Uh, okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a made up word of two, obviously two sort of Spanish roots, calle meaning street and grafia from, in, in the same sense that, you know, the etymology of the word uh, photography or in Spanish fotografia, where the idea is to paint, to draw, to write with light. In this sense, I've, I've sort of co-opted the photo part and put calle in their street. And so it's it's my belief that, you know, calligraphia has to do with the fact that the street is actually what is drawing, painting, writing, in my sense, or in my my uh, my mind, it's, it's more like writing, uh, because I think there's a narrative going on there. And it's and it's the the street that is doing that. It's my, you know, responsibility and my concern to be there and to be ready, you know, when the street presents something that that is out there and 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 to make that photograph in that sense. But it it's a totally made up word and uh you know uh, it, it it resonated for some reason when I first came up with. It. I thought, you know, yeah, yeah, this is this is it 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 uh, it it captures sort of what I'm my my philosophy of being out there on the street and and being able to shoot in a way that makes sense to me. When you're out there in the in the streets, what are you gravitating to? I mean, what do you what do you respond to? And you spoke about when you're doing a photojournalism in this very same area you're often pursuing a narrative but here mm-hmm. you're you're looking for something else what what is that i th- i think there's you know i think a lot of my photographs do have narrative i mean i i i'm a firm believer in the fact that you know the uh the narrative of a photograph you know comes from the 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 work of the photographer in the sense of when the street does present something to me that that attracts me, that calls me, that you know uh, raises some emotion in me, it's still my responsibility to put the, all those elements together, knowing where to stand, maybe knowing what lens to use, maybe looking for the light, all those kind of elements that have to come together to make you know a small. Uh, you know, a narrative in one photograph, exactly what I look for. Uh, I can, you know, I can throw some words out. I'm not sure if all of these resonating, you know, perfectly, but a lot of times juxtapositions, uh, a lot of times uh, contrast, a lot of times complexity, graphic complexity that, uh, you know, for some reason that I, that I may not know exactly when I shoot it, you know, calls to me those are those are some of the things that that i'm looking for and i and i think too i still have uh and i and i will always have i think the you know it's not to say that i can i can get away from photojournalism when i'm you know documenting on the street and 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 shooting in the central historical but i think the photojournalism sort of infuses my documentary work and the street work that i do that meaning that, you know, sometimes a lot of my stuff, the Centro stuff, the Calligrafia stuff, the black and white has a certain sense of I'm not hitting hitting the viewer over the head with, you know, a social concern. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think a lot a lot of the stuff does have a element of what uh, society and culture in Mexico City at this point in time is like. So I think that's, you know, that's an, uh, another, it, it, it possibly subconscious kind of, you know, search or what I look for when I'm on the street, that too. For the life of a freelancer, you are always multitasking. When you're not creating photography, you're prepping for meetings, catching up on your editing or managing paperwork. There are just not enough hours in the day. Challenging? Absolutely. But our friends at FreshBooks believe the rewards are so worth it. The working world has changed. With the growth of the internet, there's never been more opportunities for the self-employed. To meet this need, FreshBooks is excited to announce the launch of a new version of their cloud accounting software. It's been completely redesigned from the ground up and custom built for exactly the way you work. Get ready for the simplest way to be more productive, 
organized, and most importantly, get paid quickly. The all-new FreshBooks is not only easy to use, it's also packed full of powerful features. Create and send professional-looking invoices in less than 30 seconds, set up online payments with just a couple of clicks, and get paid up to four days faster. See when your clients have seen your invoice and put an end to the guessing game. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to TCF listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash candid and enter the candid frame in the how did you hear about us section. FreshBooks, it's small business accounting software made just for you. What are the advantages and disadvantages about being looked at by the people that you're photographing as an obvious outsider and advantage and a disadvantage? <laughs> I, th- I think, you know, I'm sort of used to the outsider thing. I've, I've, I feel like in one sense or another, I've been like an outsider most of my life. Um, and, and these are, you know, these are not, uh, you know, deep existential differences. But I mean, I, I grew up in, or I was born in the North and I grew up in the South. I went to school in the South. Um, I had, you know, sort of a, an, an outsider's viewpoint a lot of times when, when I was growing up in the South and when I went to school in the South, I looked at things a little bit differently, I think, than, you know, a Southerner does. But I, but I appreciated, you know, the South and I, you know, was, uh, was attracted to, 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 to that that perspective, I think individual perspective that I had to be able to do it like that here in Mexico city, it's obviously, you know, the difference, Mexico, United States, and, you know, relatively tall gringo out on the streets, the, the outsider, uh, becomes much more apparent. And I think, you know, to a certain extent, uh, there, there, there are both those elements. There's an advantage and there's a disadvantage. There's a, an advantage in the sense that I think a lot of people sort of, you know, maybe look at me as as a tourist with with a camera who's walking around, you know, in the centro and uh, photographing a disadvantage in the sense that uh, in, in I could almost say the same thing, a disadvantage in the sense that people look at me and see a gringo walking around with a camera and they don't want you around. <laughs> I, I've I've just sort of I'm almost I'm I'm conscious of it, but at the same time, when I'm photographing, when I'm you know sort of in that moment when I see something that I want to photograph, you know that stuff goes out the window. I don't really give you know two hoots about the fact that you know how somebody is looking at me, and it's not that I'm you know oblivious to to my surroundings, but at the same time. It, it becomes, you know, well, this is what I want to photograph and, and this is what, what I'm going to get. And, you know, that's where I go. And like I say, if I, if I walk around and I think about it, uh, yes, people, people see me and, you know, think, uh, you know, what's, what's this guy doing? You know, he's, he's walking around and, uh, he, he obviously doesn't belong here. It's, you know, it's, it's just human nature. Some people react to you weirdly. Some people, you know, they don't, you know, they don't care, Mm. you know, so. You know, over the, over the period of time that you've been there, journalists and, you know, writers and photographers have been increasingly been the targets of violence because of the cartels and the drug trade in, in Mexico. How have you seen that sort of change your experience of, uh, being a photographer down there and those of your compatriots? Um, in Mexico City, you know, there's and 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 my my work, uh, my personal work, you know, in calligraphia and on the street, it it doesn't affect me too much. The editorial work that I do and have done in like the south of Mexico, in the state of Guerrero, uh, it's it's a concern and it does you know affect me and it and it's a you know a concern to the extent of yes. You have to sort of think twice about where you go and what you do and who you're with and, you know, all those kind of questions that, uh, 
you know, it's almost, it, I'm not going to say it's operating in a war zone, but it's close to it. And, and really as, as a, as a, you know, foreign photojournalist there, I don't have to worry that much. It's not so much myself and my, you know, compatriots who are our targets. It's, you know, my friends in the Mexican press and it's my friends, the Mexican photojournalists. Those are the ones that really do have to, you know, uh, watch their backs, be concerned about, you know, definitely where they go and who they associate with. You know, there's there's just a labyrinth of of, of bad guys, <laughs> you know, that involve, you know, yes. Uh, the drug guys, yes, the mafias, but, you know, there's also institutionalized bad guys, too. And, you know, you need to, you, you need to, they, they, obviously, a Mexican reporter, a Mexican photographer, you know, has a knowledge of who's who and, you know, what's what and where to go and where not to go and do what to do and not to do. But at the same time, you know, if, if you get, uh, a little bit out of line if you get a little bit threatening to any of those entities uh, you you better watch out and so so the concern of all, all that is to say is that the concern is not that you know it's not that I don't think about it but the concern for me is not that great the concern is much more for the Mexican journalists that have to operate here and especially in places like Guerrero and the state of Veracruz, uh, two places that are, I would say, for, for, for journalists that are doing anything of count, that are doing anything that really matters, you know, it's, it, it, it's extremely dangerous. As we refer, referred to earlier, because of the lack of coverage um, here, in, at least here in the States, uh, the only information that we usually get it revolves around the whole drug trade and, you know, the deaths not only of journalists, but of, you know, women near the, uh, near the Mexican-U.S. border and, you know, all these sort of negative things. What, you live there. You work there as a photojournalist as well. So what perspective do you think is really missing when people think about Mexico that you wish that they they knew otherwise? Hmm. It, it, it fascinates me and, and, and surprises me a lot of times when I go uh, to do stories out, uh, you know, outside of Mexico City. It exists here in Mexico City, but, but c- civil society here in Mexico, I think, is extremely strong. And there are a lot of civil organizations that despite the odds, despite you know, problems with funding, despite problems with, you know, operating in places that are not the safest area. There are a lot of groups that operate here that are really trying to make a difference in 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 Mexican society and, and you know, create a more just society, create a more environmentally friendly society, create a more open society, create a society where the flow of information is is much more open and free so and i don't think a lot of those kind of stories get to people in the united states it it is you know so over weighted towards the violence towards the drugs uh and and you know obviously those things are are happening here um but i think the the other side of the coin is that you know the people La gente que that work here, that do things here, these are the people that, you know, are trying, you know, with their best effort to make changes. And, you know, and, and specifically in journalism, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, newer independent publications that are trying to make it, you know, without government support. So much of the, you know, the newspaper business here is government supported and, you know, big businessmen that have, have bought a chain of newspapers and rely on the government and scratch the government's back and get their back scratched. And if something goes wrong, if some newspaper reporter happens to be coming down against a government official in one of those small towns where one of the businessmen has his newspaper, you know, the word goes out, you know, you better shut up, you better not, you know, 
ruffle any feathers of this public official or you're not you're going to be without a job so things like that where civil society is trying to to make changes in 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 mexico i think you know to me are very important but a lot of people don't know about that stuff in the states yeah uh, you had an experience that a lot of people who th think about doing street photography are always sort of preoccupied with, even though it's fairly rare, and that was that like you were mugged once. Can you tell us about that? But uh, And what I really am kind of interested in hearing is how you sort of recovered from that and, you know, went back out in the streets, because that would dissuade a lot of people from returning to continue to do the work that they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, it was not not a fun experience as you can imagine it was i was i was actually working on a a similar project but not exactly the same i was i was walking around with a mamiya 67 and you know using it on a monopod and doing and doing portraits of people that i would run into and meet and talk to and it was a much more you know it was not you know sort of quick street photography uh the moment kind of thing it was people that i would see and want to get involved with and talk to and and make their make a portrait and you know that's probably you know i'm i'm sure you know some listeners are probably going to say what do you expect you know you're walking around in in a big city like that with a mamiya 67 and you know you're you're asking for trouble <clears throat> excuse me maybe maybe so but it was you know it was what i wanted to do and it was i was i was trying to be you know relatively safe about watching my back and where i was going and one day i didn't i went into a place that was sort of like a parking garage but had some little tiendas or little you know selling points along the side and in the back was a couple of guys couple of guys were doing uh, were welding and i saw the sparks flying and it was like oh wow you know this is this is going to be good and i didn't think twice instead of like sort of walking around the block and going in the back and be invisible i went immediately into the parking garage and it got dark and about 10 yards in you know one guy comes up to me and uh the camera was not out it was in a bag and he grabs the bag and I grab the bag back and that's when the gun came out and, you know, so I said, okay, here's the bag, take it, you know, do what you want to do. And he took the bag and I turned to leave and there was another guy on the left side and he's the one that hit me with the gun butt and, you know, luckily it didn't do any damage to my eye, but it, you know, broke <coughs> uh, uh, skin and uh, I bled for quite a while and 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 you know there were no lasting physical effects from that the the above the eye healed with a scar and that was fine but yes the you know sort of the psychological emotional uh end of things it took me a while and you know it was like i i sort of had to say to myself you know well yes you can come up with another project yes you can uh you know go to another part of the city yes you can you know uh go around with a bodyguard yes you can you know do a lot of things but in the end it was like i had always sort of from the start the 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 our the uh mamiya project with the portraits was sort of a a little detour because everything that i had done before in the centro you know was was with a Leica and, and walking around on the streets. And I said, you know, to myself at that point, you know, you, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can let this keep you from where you want to photograph or you can, you know, try and, you know, little by little sort of get back into it. And that's basically what I did. I went back to, you know, I obviously didn't have the, the Mamiya to continue the, the, the portrait project, but I did have, you know, Leicas and I went back, you know, on the street with the Leicas after a while and, and, you know, walked, I learned a different way to walk. Let's put it that way. I, you know, became a little bit more conscious of, you know, who was around me, where I was, what was going on around me. But at the same time, I, I sort of, you know, quickly got back into that thing that I mentioned before about, you know, when you're in the moment and when you feel like, you know, this is the photograph that you want to make. There's nothing that's going to stop you. And that's, you know, it took a while to get back to that. But I, you know, I did. And I, you know, 
I, I don't know if I'm a little bit more cautious or a little bit more, you know, aware of, of my surroundings, you know, today, but I try to be. And, uh, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I sort of wouldn't know what to do with myself. Yeah. I, I couldn't, couldn't go back down there and, and photograph. So that's, uh, yeah. And it's, 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 it's something that, yes, uh, you know, a photographer in, the in the, in the downtown central area, I would say of, you know, pretty much any big city, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily a dangerous area here in Mexico city, but you get, you know, onto the fringes of places where, you know, it can happen and, and you just have to be, you know, a little bit extra aware, I guess. Uh, one of the stories that's on your website is about, uh, the, the bestia, the, the, the train uh-huh. that people uh-huh. take from, you know, Central Americans and Mexicans and South Americans take to trying to get up to the, uh, U S Mexico border. Tell us about the, 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 how that story developed and, and the challenges that you faced in creating, creating those pictures. I, sh- I actually shot that for a, uh, for an NGO, the international organization for migration out of Geneva. And I was working with a couple of, uh, women who were representatives for that organization and, and the other, uh, organization here. It's called Comar. It's the, the UN, what is it? UN High Commissioner for Refugees, yeah. UNHCR. Yeah. So, so there were those two women. I was working with them, and we were doing some stuff uh, from basically in the state of Chiapas on the on the Guatemalan border, and talking to people that were coming across uh, on the on the Suchiate River, photographing there. And I had been there numerous times, probably five or six times before. So I sort of knew the territory and I knew, knew what was involved. Uh, after a hurricane, I think it was, I don't remember the name of the hurricane, but it was like 19, I'm sorry, 2000, probably about 2010. The train tracks used to go all the way down there to the border, exactly on the border, a cargo train, a freight train. And so Migrants could hop on the train there and basically get up to the state of Veracruz or over to uh, and and then over to Mexico City and then northward. The hurricane tore up the tracks, so the starting place now for that train became a place called Arriaga in Chiapas, and and migrants uh, from Central America and uh, South America and and even Africa at that point there were some. Uh, I met a guy from, what is it, uh, Guinea-Bissau, and a couple of people from from other, you know, West African nations that had gone to Brazil and had come up. And the the idea there in, in, in Arriaga is to, once again, get on the train, go over a little into the state of Oaxaca, and then go north into Veracruz and over to Mexico City. We were, myself and the two women, were working in, in uh, outside the, at, a, at a refugee place, a Catholic church refugee shelter outside the city of Tapachula, and we were in touch with people in other refugee shelters throughout the state, and we got a call at one point saying that La Bestia, the train, was making up, meaning that they were moving cars and putting, you know, cars together to make the trip. And that doesn't happen with any regularity. It might be, you know, one day and then four days, you know, before another one goes. And so when we heard that, we said, well, you know, we should go over there. We should, you know, obviously do something on that. And so we hightailed it to Arriaga. It took about two, two and a half hours. We got there about midday, about 1130 in the morning and yes sure enough you know the train was making up and people were starting to climb up aboard uh to to like reserve their place on the top and at the ends of some of the cars the cars that have uh carry liquids have like an indentation on the ends and there's places to sit and even sleep uh in those places but most people end up going up on the top of the rail cars which at that point the the temperature was probably about 35 degrees and up top it was just like you know a flat iron uh you know a hot iron you know uh, an oven basically up on top and 
people, you know, were little by little lining up and climbing up and getting up there with a piece of cardboard to try and protect themselves against the heat. At some point, I'd, I'd, like I say, I'd seen this before. I had covered, you know, migrants getting on the train, migrants waiting for the train, all that. But, it, but at one point, I started to see all these kids, and I thought, this is this is strange. This is different, you know. And there were kids, you know, like 12, 13, 14 years old, a lot of them, you know, making their way up to the top or in those areas at the ends of the trains. And then – at one point, I started to see a lot of babies. There were families that were that were migrating, the husband, the wife, the kid, and a lot of times the kid was, you know, a baby. And so there were babies being hoisted, you know, as best they could up until the top. Um, and so I, you know, I photographed that and it was like, you know, I still couldn't quite believe what I was seeing in front of the lens and in front of the camera, but, you know. Uh, continued photographing and, and, and watching this, you know, procession of humanity that was that was trying to you know escape from where they were and to get to the u.s i stayed and photographed until about probably about 5 30 that afternoon so most of the photographs from that that series are are in that you know one one day probably six hour uh period the amazing thing about this is like i said the train started to make up at about 11, 11.30, people started climbing up. It did not leave from Arriaga until 11.30 at night. Mm -hmm. So there were people that were up on top of that train for 12 hours, you know, uh, surviving as they can. I mean, because if you get down, you know, to buy a bottle of water, to go take a piss, to do whatever, you lose your place. I mean, you're, you're not, you know, there's not necessarily anybody up there unless you have a group of friends that are going to save your place and, and guard it. You know, it just becomes more and more crowded and your space sort of gets, you know, taken over by, by the crowd. But, uh, you know, this was 2014 and I have, I've been back once since then, but th I'm, I'm, you know, from what I hear and what I, you know, people that I talk to, what's going on right now is not quite back up to 2014 levels, but there are, once again, there's a big spike in teenagers and kids that are, are, are trying to get north. They're not riding the bestia because the bestia has basically been shut down by the Mexican government. Uh, and so that train does not run. And so the problem now is how do you get from you know, point A to point B. And a lot of times it's buses uh, that you have to get off or public transportation that you have to get off where there's a checkpoint on a highway and you have to go out into a field and walk around the checkpoint. There's uh, just, you know, a myriad number of ways and, and a lot of it becomes walking. And, and so, you know, we're talking about people that are, you know, not walking the whole way from the southern Mexican border to the to the northern border, but a lot of times there's a lot of walking involved. So mm. that's sort of the situation today. It's amazing imagery and just amazing story. Um, what what do you find uh, over the years that you've been there uh, and, and photographing? What what for you is the most gratifying thing about the work that you do? You know, selfishly, I think it's it's the people that I've met. You know that I've been able to you know connect with in in doing stories in 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 you know in the centro and walking around the center i mean i have friends that i see and and sort of pop in on if they're working somewhere or right on the street that i see and you know and say hey to them uh and and we talk and you know i that 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 connection you know keeps me going back to the center oh, that's that's another thing that keeps me going back just those friends that i've met you know and i that that's my that's my personal work and those are people that I know and and you know have come to you know hang out with or respect in the centro and the the other side you know the the photojournalistic work I, I have no you know grand illusions that anything that I've ever shot you know has any kind of uh, major say policy or social impact but at the same time I do feel like you know that 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 I have been able to, uh, in some small way, give a voice to people that 
maybe don't necessarily have a way to express what they're going through in life and, and the problems that they have and the situation that they find themselves in, um, whether or not that makes for a change in attitude of someone that maybe reads or sees the story. I'm not sure, but, you know, I like to think that in some small way, yes, that has, that has happened at one time or another, but that, that, I think uh, I don't think it's a pie in the sky, you know, idea that somehow, some way, uh, the the photographs that a photojournalist takes can can somehow change an attitude, and possibly with a change of attitude, you know, change change politics or change what what the way things are done, shall we say? Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, um, I doubt seriously that many photographers uh, outside Mexico know a guy by the name of Nacho Lopez. Uh, he, to me, is like sort of the the epitome of of what uh, I aspired to as a, as a photographer. He was a photojournalist. He was also sort of a formalist. He did a lot of experimentation, you know, with uh, contact printing with uh, photograms. But he was he was a man of the street. He was out there on the street, and he did a lot of projects. He did uh, he was he was concerned with uh, the indigenous problem here in Mexico, and did a lot of uh, photo essays on on indigenous populations in Mexico. He, to me, uh, and 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 obviously, uh, just the graphic sensibility that he had, the way he photographed, and and what he put in the frame, and how he looked, and the impetus that uh that the stimulus that uh that that attracted him to photograph i think are similar you know or i i would hope that there there are similar things that attract me but if uh people have a chance to look for for his work nacho lopez uh he's he's one of my uh heroes shall we say of photography Oh, great. Thank you for that suggestion and thank you for making time for me uh this morning I so much appreciate it keith it was a good talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for taking the time and hope people will get something out of it. Thanks again to Keith Dannemiller for joining us here at TCF. You can check out his work by visiting KeithDannemiller.com. Remember that you can and you do play a big role in introducing others to the work that we do here at TCF. Take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Thanks to Heiko Rill from Canada for his five-star review. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. You can contribute amounts of $2, $5, $10 or more, or anything in between on a monthly basis and help make a big difference to the work we're doing here at TCF. We've made some changes to the gifts that we provide our supporters. At the $5 a month level and higher, you will receive free copies of exclusive TCF ebooks written by me. The first of which will be released next week. The first one is called Nine Pictures, Nine Stories and tells the stories behind some of the photographs that I've created with tips and suggestions to help you the next time you go out to make photographs. Supporters can expect to receive that first ebook this week. I'll also be scheduling monthly live hangouts to discuss different aspects of photography as well as field questions. Patreon supporters of $10 or more will receive priority invitations to these hangouts, which will be recorded and distributed through the TCF YouTube channel. Find out all that we have to offer and help support the show by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and the candid frame website. And thanks to Sean Staples and Mark Brown for throwing out their support to the work that we do here at TCF. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com, and our senior producer is Cynthia Parker. 
And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>